focus on the issues. And the numerous proposals emerged to solve the convergence in grains and oil seeds and wheat in particular. Three major types of proposals. One is to address the structural issues, in particular in the wheat contract. And the structural issue here is that the production of wheat has moved west to uh, Minnesota and North Dakota, but the delivery areas remained along the uh, you know, Chicago, Illinois waterway area. Another set of proposals is to address the carry, to uh, limit the, uh, to, to move away from full carry effectively, to limit speculative ownership of certificates, to limit market participation of index funds, to increase storage rates, to do something that would make carry more expensive, uh, basically. And the third one is to address the decoupling of cash and futures market in some in some more drastic way, to just basically separate the two markets, either through a compelled loadout, modified compelled loadout, or cash settlement. So that was the initial involvement. And then the subsequent involvement, as, as these problems we, we've noticed from the charts that you saw before and were not being solved, the uh, CFTC formed a subcommittee on convergence as the uh, subcommittee of this Agricultural Advisory Committee. Eighteen members of the subcommittee were selected uh, from 36 candidates uh, who submitted their, um, uh, their, their, the candidates. And, and the uh, sort of the principle that we're following in, in uh, working on this issue is uh, to introduce greater transparency and to induce collaboration, to, to elicit collaboration among those who are in the market uh, uh, dealing with this contract, the exchange, the regulators, and others. So the, trans the, uh, the, the work of the subcommittee was done in the, in the full, the formation and the work was done in a full transparent fashion. All the meetings were announced. Uh, public was able to uh, uh, listen to all of the meetings, and the subcommittee discussed ways to address uh, contract design issues among the, the ones that I showed you before. Basically, there are five, five different types of uh, options in the menu of options. To introduce new part delivery area for wheat, to increase storage rates, to put penalties on ownership of certificates, to uh, uh, compel the loadout, and, and to look into a cash settlement of this contract. The uh, full report of the uh, uh, subcommittee is in your binders. Uh, the, uh, the main recommendation that emerged in the last uh, uh, conference call in September 2009 is that the subcommittee recommended to the CFTC's Agricultural Advisory Committee that the CME group adopts a variable storage rate mechanism for CBOT wheat contracts starting with the December 09 contract. Uh, at that point, Dave Levin, representative of the CME group uh, on the subcommittee, objected to this recommendation. The rest of, um, of the report, the underlying, the background, the summary, and who is on the subcommittee is, uh, as, as I said in your binders, the subcommittee during that conference call also decided that it will remain as an ad hoc body to monitor progress with this, with the wheat contract and, and other agricultural contracts mm -hmm. and to see how it could be of further assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. David? Thank you, Commissioner Dunn. Uh, thanks for bringing the Ag Advisory Committee together, the experts in the industry, to uh, discuss this issue. I, I think we're, we're finally there, and, um, and there's no not after that statement, because I think the variable storage rate is, is a, a, a very innovative concept. It's one that addresses the, the fundamental cause that uh, the research has shown uh, behind the lack of convergence, and that's spreads reaching full carry and, uh, and not being able to expand further because of the fixed storage rate. I, I just wanted to clarify 
Andre's last comment was that he noted that that I did not support the subcommittee recommendation, and and that's that's not correct, as uh, as I think everyone that's involved with the subcommittee knows, the variable storage rate proposal came from CME Group. Um, we developed it in uh, in the fall of 2008, and uh, and presented that to the subcommittee. <clears throat> what I objected to was the uh, implementation date, the December implementation date. So uh, what I want to do today is, is go through Put up on full screen. Oops, okay. And that is go through what, what the variable, variable storage rate uh, proposal is. Uh, and, and we submitted this to CFTC, as Commissioner Dunn noted, in, uh, in late September, uh, mm -hmm. September 29th to be exact. It's under a 45-day review. Um, and and what, what the, the proposal or what the mechanism essentially does is introduce a transparent market-driven formula that would allow storage rates to expand uh, at, at every expiration or following every expiration. So today we have a seasonal storage rate in place that expands twice a year or expands once a year and then retracts. Uh, it, it expands in July, stays in effect through uh, mid-December when the storage demand is greatest and storage costs are higher, and then it reverts back to five cents per bushel per month in December. The variable rate has a is a mechanism that will allow the rate to increase by that same amount, by three cents per bushel per month at each expiration if the spread as a, a percentage of financial full carry is 85 percent or greater. If the spread, conversely, is 50 percent of full carry or less, the storage rate would would decrease by, by the same amount, by three cents per bushel per month. So the, the two variables in the calculation are uh, full carry, and that's what this first chart or slide shows, and, uh, and that's a straightforward calculation. Uh, we do use the three-month LIBOR rate plus 200 basis points. Yeah, I, I just, for the record, think that that's more than full carry, but we could ask the committee how many of you finance at LIBOR plus 200. I'd be interested as we go around the table. How many of you finance at LIBOR plus 200? How many, how many finance at something else? Yeah, I, that's, right now it's 2.28. Percent. So if if you know if you have a cost of money that's less than 2.28 percent, then uh, your full carry calculation would be a little different. Not everyone in the market has the same cost of funds. Uh, we we know that for a fact. Uh, different uh, uh, entities have uh, capital available at different rates. Uh, we did a survey, a broad survey of the marketplace on this particular. Uh, question and the uh, the survey responses were were very strongly uh, in favor that 200 basis points over LIBOR is an appropriate cost of capital. Um, the the next variable in the calculation is just a number of days and that's typically either 60 or 61 or 62 in a two month spread or 90 or 91 or 92 in a three month spread. Um, and, and then, obviously, the futures price of the nearby contract and the daily storage premium uh, are, are the other uh, variables in the calculation. So how we implement this is the, the, the spread is uh, calculated every day beginning on the 18th calendar day of the month prior to the delivery month. And then it's compared to, to this full carry calculation. That period from the 18th calendar day through option expiration day, so that's roughly uh, 35, uh, 40 days, we, we do the calculation and, and calculate the, the average. And if over that 35 or 40 day period, the average is 85% of full carry or greater, then on the 18th 
calendar day of the month, of the delivery month, after deliveries have uh, taken place, we increase the storage rate by three cents per month. That then stays in effect until the next calculation period. Uh, we start calculating for the following delivery month uh, right away on the, the next calendar day, do the same calculation through option expiration day prior to the, the next futures month expiration, average it and, and have the same, uh, you know, same announcement. And we'll, we'll publish this on our website every day. Um, it'll be transparent for the market to observe what our calculation is. If, if someone has a different rate of interest and, and their calculation is a little different, they'll, you know, they'll be able to see what, what, what we're uh, uh, publishing anyway. Uh, and so this will be a, a, a running mechanism that continues throughout uh, uh, the crop year. Um, if, as I said, that calculation results in a, a ratio that's 50 percent or less of full carry, the storage rate will come down by three cents per bushel per month. But it will never fall below uh, five cents per bushel per month or the 16.5 uh, hundredths of a cent per bushel per day. Uh, that will be a floor. Um, so it, in, in our view, it's a, it's a very market-oriented a way to allow the spreads to expand, uh, and as the spreads expand and, and are better able to represent the, the cost of carry in the cash market, we expect the front end of the futures curve to, uh, to come down and, and meet the cash market. Um, as I said, the components of the calculation, three-month LIBOR plus 200, market feedback confirmed that as an accurate, transparent measure of the cost of capital. Um, current spreads actually confirm that. Uh, if you look at the, uh, where the spreads are today using uh, that interest rate, uh, we're 95 to 97 percent of full carry in the nearby spreads. Um, the trigger level of 85 percent. There's been some discussion of that, and uh, some have used 80 percent as, as the level to trigger an increase in storage rate. Uh, we think 85 percent is, is the right uh, trigger level. It, it's, it's a level that makes it a little harder to achieve an expansion in storage rates, and, and there, is, there is an economic incentive in this mechanism for uh, for firms who are carrying wheat to, to try to achieve a higher storage rate by getting those spreads out beyond the trigger level. So, so we don't want to set the trigger level, level too low and, uh, and uh, you know, make that uh, too easy. We, we, want to, we want convergence. We all, all agree on the objective. We just want to make sure that the mechanism doesn't introduce too much um, uh, uh, too much flexibility, I guess, or volatility into, uh, into what storage rates and carrying charges are. Uh, likewise, the 50 percent trigger for lowering storage rates uh, was, uh, was uh, uniformly supported by the, the marketplace in our survey. And, and again, we think it's, it's an appropriate number at which to, to uh, lower storage rates and, and does make it uh, a kind of difficult target for those who want lower storage rates to, uh, if, they're, if they're trading in spreads, to, to try to achieve that. It, it's, uh, it's something that it won't be all that easy to achieve. Um, this is just a history, and I know uh, Krista and Dave went over uh, kind of the chronology of the changes in the week contract. Uh, this is uh, a chronology of, of the storage rates in the week contract. Uh, Jan 2000 through July of 08, uh, they were 15 one hundredths of a cent per bushel per day or four and a half cents per month. Uh, in July of 08, we made a, an increase to 16 and a half one hundredths or, or five cents per bushel per month, so roughly a 25 percent increase in storage rates at that time. We still observed problems with convergence, so we uh, quickly after the July 08 change uh, convened uh, industry group, uh, two industry meetings actually in Chicago to look at what the next changes in the wheat contract 
uh, should be to, to address the, the basis convergence issue. Uh, at that time, we agreed on the seasonal storage rate, uh, which increases from five to eight cents per month during that July through uh, December uh, period, and the additional delivery points uh, on the Ohio River, Mississippi, and, and Northwest Ohio. So uh, September 2010 going forward, we hope that we have a, a variable storage rate in, in place. And uh, as I said, this is what's currently pending uh, CFTC approval. Um, we wanted to, to look at, at why uh, the CME group believes in implementing this change in September of 2010. Uh, all of the previous changes that, that uh, Krista discussed and the, the changes that I just discussed uh, have generally been agreed to uh, around this time of year or maybe even a little earlier and then implemented beginning with the next crop year. And in wheat, the, the new crop begins in July of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, in the calendar. It's a, a winter uh, grain, so July through uh, June is the, the, the crop year in terms of the futures market. Uh, and that's been our practice in terms of implementing the new delivery locations. They were effective this July, uh, the seasonal storage rate, same time. Last, uh, in July of 2008, as I said, we implemented the uh, higher storage rate and shipping certificates. So that's been our practice is to obviously not affect open interest. And, uh, and not affect the, uh, the value of positions that are already held in the market. Uh, so I've listed what the open interest here is. Uh, this is as of, I believe, the 23rd of October, 185,000 contracts in December, and, uh, and you can see across the board uh, in the first four months anyway, out through July, where there's uh, 45,000 contracts in open interest. So if we were to implement uh, the variable storage rate in December, which uh, the subcommittee proposed and, and which I objected to uh, in the subcommittee report, that would impact all of this open interest that you see on this slide, this uh, roughly uh, over 250,000 contracts of open interest. So the D-SMART spread is a three-month spread. That could widen out by nine cents per bushel, three, three cents in each in each month. So uh, we would see that spread potentially going from 19 cents to 27 cents. The March-May spread uh, could widen out as much as 12 cents per bushel. Now, of course, we're, we're just saying everything else equal, we increase the storage rate by, uh, you know, 3 cents per month, this is what the spreads would do. And, of course, we can't predict what other changes might be going on in the market, but, but this is the best we can do in terms of trying to quantify this issue uh, today. So, uh, uh, if you... We, we got to just... Well, oh. I just didn't understand the arithmetic. It's a pure... Why would, uh, if you go back a slide, mm -hmm. why would March, May go out 12 cents and May, July go out 19 cents? Uh, I mean, I'm just pure arithmetic. Why? Sure. Because these... Uh, these actually build on, these are assuming full carry and they are cumulative. So if we increase the storage rate in December to um, eight cents per bushel per month, and then in March we increase it to 11, and May we increase it to 14, that's these these build on on each other, uh, Mr. Chairman. So that that's how the variable I mechanism. See. But if it, for instance, was just put in in place in March, then it would be two more months to the March May. Is that? If it was implemented in March, in March we'll have a five cent storage rate because the seasonal would have expired at that point. So we would increase the March May by three. The May July would be three on top of that if we're still at full carry. So March, May would go up to eight, May, July would go up to, and, and so this is all what would happen if we implemented in December. Right. I'll, but I'll get be, to the March. Be, it, yeah, it, maybe it's a later chart. It'd be helpful to know if it's March, because yeah, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in, okay. in a later chart. But uh, again, Dave, just clarification here. It's based upon the assumption of full carriage and that there's no impact to the rule. 
That's right. It's based on the assumption that these spreads are at full carry and the VSR is triggered based on the formula that, that we've uh, proposed to CFTC. That, so each of these spreads still remain at 85 percent of full carry. They trigger another increase as we go, uh, go through and, time. And, and isn't it correct that uh, this past year you actually implemented uh, changes on the July contract and there were open interests? So last September and December uh, there were recommendations and they were implemented on contracts that were open. Is that correct? Yes, and sep the September implementation would be on open interest, too. And the requirement for that is that the Commission must approve that. If, right. so, if, so it's not a pure black and white thing that uh, you never implement something on open interest. No. The, the black and white for us, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that we go to the next crop year. And because the old crop, new crop uh, dynamics, the fundamentals between crop years are usually quite different and, and there's a lot of variability from one crop year to the next and therefore uh, going out to a new crop month uh, gives us the most comfort and, and the market has, has been uh, comfortable with that as well. But, but that's with respect to crop years, not uh, just to uh, make sure we clarify, it's not related to the open interest then because you have the CME uh, has put in place changes even when there's open interest outstanding? It, yes, and, uh, but that's subject to commission approval. So doing the math, and uh, this is again a static analysis of what the financial impact would be of implementing the variable storage rate in December of this year, which is what the subcommittee recommended, uh, would have a potential worst case scenario of $384 million impact on the marketplace. Implementing in March. D Dave, uh, again, a point of clarification, that impact is on swap dealers, is that? No, or this, swap is, traders this is or an impact on, on the entire open interest, interest. Okay. in the marketplace. Did you try to calculate the cost of the inefficiency in the marketplace on producers, uh, grain handlers, processors, and end users? We did not make that calculation, but as the charts that um, Dave and Krista showed, the basis from September of 2008 until September of 2009 in Toledo, anyway, strengthened from about $2 under to uh, roughly 60 under. So I would, I would theorize, and, and some of the commercial traders who are here could confirm it uh, better than I, that, that that's a pretty good pickup uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the short hedger. So the short hedger uh, has a basis position. They're long cash. They sell futures. And, uh, and when the basis strengthens, that benefits the short hedger. Now, if the basis weakens, so it's all timing. It's when you put your futures position on and how the basis moves during the time you hold your futures position. But if you were buying grain uh, at harvest, uh, buying wheat at harvest last, last September at $2 under, and you sold it in May or June of this year at $1 under, you gain a uh, dollar on the basis as a short hedger. So, uh, you know, I, I would let, obviously, anyone else who, who might have a comment on inefficiencies by producers, uh, uh, they can certainly. Well, I, I kind of circumvent it. what I set up as ground rules, saying we'd wait till after the presentation. But I, I would like those that are uh, producers and uh, grain handlers, processors, and end users to think about that. And uh, during this uh, the, next, the round of questioning or comment period, uh, get your input on that. Very good. Uh, so moving on to the March, if we implemented this in March of 2010, obviously we miss the big hump of open interest that's in December. There's 182,000 contracts open interest in December. March would get us beyond that, but March is still, March, May spread was 97% of full carry when I calculated it the other day. So that means if we implement this in March, 
that spread could go out by three cents per bushel. The May-July spread could expand as well, and, uh, and so when you calculate the feedback effects of uh, implementing in March on the open interest uh, in each uh, contract month, you come up with a, a total of $46 million that would be transferred as a result of the exchange implementing a change on, on existing open interest that, that affects pricing of the contract. Dave, just arithmetic. Again, this assumes that it stays all in full carry, these fancy Latin words, ceteris paribus. I mean, means yeah, all else, else being, being, equal, being equal, which also right. means, like, that's not the real world, but okay. It's the best right. we can do with the data we have. Well, all right. Mr. Chairman, I thought after our last hearing you weren't going to use Latin. <laughs> <laughs> it's others that put them in the reports. I, I don't know. But. Yeah, my uh, my economist threw that in, so I'll, I'll have to go back and uh, and have him uh, stick to English in the future. Um, if we implement in May 2010, now we're getting um, you know we have less open interest that potentially is impacted, um, uh, and uh, the May July spread though is at full carry, so that that spread would be impacted. Um, and so we see that spread widening out from uh, 10 and a quarter to 16 cents. And the financial impacts then uh, are shown on this slide of, a, of what we estimate at $8, $8 million. Um, if we implement in July of this year, uh, the July SEP is trading inside full carry, so that, that potentially uh, implementing variable storage rate in July may not affect that spread at all. And as I said, the July futures contract is the first month in the crop year for wheat. Um, the reason we didn't propose July is that on July 18th, the day that the, the July, uh, the day the storage rate would be increased under the variable trigger, we already increased the storage rate by three cents, by the same amount under the seasonal rate that's in place today. So there's significant open interest in July. It's, it's possible under the variable storage rate that as the market dynamics are changing, the variable rate might not be triggered in July. The July SEP spread might trade un, under 85% of full carry and we would then not have an increase to $0.08 cents on July 18th. Um, however, if we leave the seasonal storage rate in place that's there today, we will increase to $0.08 cents on July 18th, and then we move to September, and the variable storage rate would then replace the seasonal rate in September. It would work on top of the $0.08 cents that's already in place because of the July seasonal going into effect. So, so that's the play on July. I mean, it's, it's a little complicated, and, and I apologize for that, but um, it, it seems like July would be a, a, a good alternative, but, but it does have the other side of the uh, equation of the, of the rate perhaps not being triggered by a variable mechanism in July when it's already going to increase due to the seasonal rate. So, so there really is no estimated financial impact of a July or September implementation, although the caveat on the July is that uh, it, it could be impacted the other way. Uh, but, uh, but Dave, uh, you seem to indicate that, that May wouldn't have a material change in the, the contract. Is, is that correct, too? Well, our, our estimates are an $8 million uh, effect, and that's across the open interest that's uh, in May. and. Uh, and July that, that would be impacted. So uh, as you move uh, through the months of the old crop uh, contracts, uh, the, the contracts, you have less open interest that, that would be impacted. Uh, and you don't have this building and cumulative effect uh, that, that we assumed as we went from December through. Uh, but, but again, that's the, that's the, you know, the, the best guesstimate that you can give right now, and so it, it, it's it's a it's a, a time certain length enough that uh, you know your presumptions, the calculations you're making could significantly change. I mean, it's yeah, it's a pretty long way away. So it's it eight is, million dollars. Right. I'm not saying eight million is a diminished amount. It's definitely not if you're 
a, a farmer or an elevator or, or somebody you're dealing with this, but um, it could change significantly between it, now and then, right? It sure, it sure could. That, okay. That's right, Commissioner. And, and as uh, I'm sure many of the producers and uh, merchandisers in the room can attest, we've got a very challenging uh, weather situation in the Midwest right now. Uh, wet weather is delaying planting of the winter wheat crop. I've been reading estimates we may have one to two million acres less uh, winter wheat planted this year because of the wet weather. A lot of winter wheat is planted uh, double crop with soybeans and, and the soybean harvest is just delayed because of the wet weather. So we might have a very different fundamental situation by, by May or July of next year. Uh, Dave, um, Professor Irwin has uh, is kind of drawn a bright line at the 80% level of full carry. Have you run mm -hmm. these numbers against that calculation? Um, the, the, this chart, uh, Scott is, uh, uh, Commissioner Amelia, is that I just put up now, uh, looks at the spreads as a percent of full carry going back to March of 2007. So uh, what we see in this chart is that out of these 14, I believe there are 14 expirations, an 85% trigger would have uh, been hit nine times. We wouldn't have triggered the lower storage rate at all uh, during these 14 expirations. And in five of these expirations, there would be no change, meaning we fell between 85 and 50. Only one of these expirations fell between 85 and 80. So in March of 07, as you can see, there was a 82 percent uh, calculation. And again, this is based on what we saw in history, and it doesn't take into effect if you triggered higher storage, then what would the following spread trade at? I mean, the following spread is going to be different if you triggered higher storage, but we, we didn't, you know, we had no way to observe that from the data. So we just said from the data that we have, uh, if we look back through time and back test this a little bit, there's only one case where it fell between 80 and 85. So that, that's kind of a, a non-event, it, it looks like, from the data, uh, but to be conservative and, and you know, our, our, our primary goal is to, is to really do no damage, do no harm in the market. We thought choosing 85 made, uh, you know, was, a, was a, a cautious way to proceed on this. Uh, there's an appendix in the handout, and, and I, if anyone, uh, if there's anything that anyone has seen in that that they would like me to comment, I'd be happy to. Uh, this just gives uh, really kind of a recap of a lot of the data that Krista and, uh, and Dave already presented, uh, shows the actual basis convergence uh, at expiration uh, for the last year and a half or so. Um, uh, but I don't plan to, to, to cover this unless anyone would like me to comment on, on anything in that appendix. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now take uh, a, a 10 minute break. Uh, it might stretch into 15. Yes. Uh, and uh, after that break, uh, the panelists are going to be jo joined by Mr. Brenz and Mr. Bartlett, who are going to give their reaction. Uh, to the presentations we've heard so far. Then I'll open up for any other public comment that they may have on this proposal and then open it up for uh, questions uh, by the AAC. So if we can get back here in uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, we're in good shape.